<laughs> right here, we have certain states. See, we're not looking to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has already been invented. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it, correct? Mm -hmm. That's what we hear. That's right. Uh, there are other states, there are altogether 10 states that have open discovery, which is, a, which is what we want to be able to have adopted in this state, right? So it's not like as if uh, we want you to say, well, aren't they trying to create something that's nowhere been proven and tested? It has, as Chucky said, right across the bridge in New Jersey. I was a defense lawyer in New Jersey, so I know what it was like. And I handled cases from petty larceny to murders to death penalty cases. I've done it all. And I recall from day one when someone gets arrested, in Jersey, they have something called a central, uh, central judicial processing, which is tantamount to an arraignment here in New York. And from the very moment that you are brought before a judge, because at arraignment, that's the very first time any individual who's arrested of a crime mm -hmm. is presented formally, formally charged in a courtroom. And at that point, three things happen. You either you plead guilty or not guilty. If you don't have a lawyer and you can't afford one, one will be appointed. And of course, if there's going to be any bail imposed, it'll be imposed at that point at the arraignment. Well, in New York, that's all that happens. There is no turning over of any kinds of evidentiary uh, matters that may very well go towards proving this case by the prosecution. Okay. In Jersey, it's completely different. From day one, they turn over what's referred, what's referred to here as UF 61s, that police complaint reports. They turn over any witnesses' statements. Witnesses' addresses and names, and of course you might say, oh my God, you're going to turn over the witnesses' and names and addresses, aren't you going to mm -hmm. and, and jeopardize them and parallel them? Mm -hmm. You turn over any sort of statement, any sort of uh, grand jury testimony, as soon as the grand jury testimony is, get, is rendered, <coughs> it's turned over, and as Chucky said, convicts or, or criminals are not walking the street uh, got, uh, got free. That's not happening. But what it is happening is that on those at the very from the very first outset, when someone's charged with a crime, that person knows right from the very outset whether he or she wants to go ahead and test the waters. You don't have the type of delays because when you present someone, a good example, you present someone with all the evidence, as much of evidence as, as you have at your and your possession at the time as your lawyer, and you put it on the table like I would do. I would say, now look at that, because that's what they say they have thus far. Let's, let's go over it. What you know is what I know, and what, and what we know is what they know. You make the call what you want to do. Someone who's been around the system a while, someone who's, who's been, uh, who, who knows the system, has broken the law, and has, they'll look at it, and they'll say, you know what? See if you can get me the best deal possible, mm -hmm. at the earliest possible point. When people are not guilty, they will tend to say, I didn't do it. I'm not guilty. I can't see myself doing it. I can't, I can't. And when you don't have the evidence sufficient enough to be able to confirm and say, well, this is what they say they have, because you as a lawyer here in New York, you don't know that. It's all guesswork. And as Chucky says, 95 to 97 percent of the cases in criminal court today, in the criminal system, plead out. And notice what happens at a uh, plea agreement. The prosecutor says, this is what we're going to offer. And as Chucky said, you want, you as the lawyer for the defendant are required now to ask your client whether he or she should plead when you in fact aren't even aware of what they have. What that reads is in fact a lot of tension. How often do we hear law defendants say, my lawyer, I think he's selling me down a river. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. He's selling me down a river because he's not helping me, he's not giving me the information that I need. Mm -hmm. Clearly he can't because the information is not available to him. Now, the first knee-jerk response that most folks have is, if I had a private lawyer, I'd put money in his pocket, and he would make my work miracles. Well, let me just tell you this. Legal aid has a lot of critics. The public defenders have a lot of critics. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Very few people, very few attorneys know more about the criminal justice system than they do, because they do this on a day-to-day -day basis. However, because they're overwhelmed and inundated with so many cases, they cannot give your individual case the kind of attention that you deserve. But see, but to you who has a family member, you don't want to hear that because for you, this is not an everyday thing. This is a unique situation. So you want to take care of the matter the best way you can. <laughs> so then it creates a lot of friction and tension, resentment. And as a result, we have people then taking a plea agreements that normally would not, but for the fact that they are afraid. Uh -huh. I'll tell you this. When you are confronted in that criminal justice system, 
The one overriding emotion that takes place is fear because you don't know what happens. The minute you get arrested and you are, com and you are processed, you are assigned what is referred to as a New York State criminal identification number. That's your NYSIC number. That is your identity. If you want to locate someone in the prison system by way of name, date of birth, they're going to say, forget that. We need that NYSIC number because that's how they trace you. That's how they keep you know, track. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that because your whole, your, your whole persona, your whole essence of being is it, 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 completely done away with. Mm -hmm. But let's keep, on, let's keep on point with respect to this criminal discovery. What happens on the civil end when we're talking about money? I want you to listen very carefully now. When we talk about money, property, well, guess what? When you're suing somebody civilly, there is complete and open discovery. Mm -hmm. Because there, they say that it's not right for one party who's suing the other to be able to ambush or surprise that party that's being sued. And likewise, the party that's being sued has also a reciprocal obligation to turn over to the plaintiff who's suing them whatever evidence they have and they intend to, show, uh, to, uh, to, to have at court to prove their defense to. Criminal discovery also has reciprocal requirements. It's just not the prosecutor turning over the thing, but it's also the defendant must turn over things to the prosecutor, which is nothing wrong with that. It's an equal exchange. But it's not equal the way it stands now. It is not. It, there is a complete imbalance. And you know why you know it's an imbalance from the very outset? Because whenever someone is charged with a crime, it says on the caption, the people of the state of New York mm -hmm. versus John Doe. The people of the state of New York versus Mary Doe. That tells you everything. Because on the one hand, you have the solitary individual who is on the receiving end being charged, and you have the awesome weight of the state apparatus as represented by the people of the state of New York. District attorneys, the police, law enforcement, the various uh, 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 laboratory facilities that are available to the uh, prosecution to develop that case and to prove their case. And what do you have on your side? Nothing. You have that one lawyer who perhaps, hopefully, is going to be your shield, and when he tries to get certain types of expert witnesses, especially if you're a private lawyer doing public, doing these legal aid cases, 18B lawyers, you try to hire yourself some sort of an, uh, an expert, someone who can perhaps come in, or even an investigator, and you'll see, and I think, well, if you've done 18B, you'll see how, so, how often when you, yeah, as a private lawyer, 18B representing indigent, you go to get someone to retain them to be your investigator, and the minute you tell them, I'm 18B, which means to the, the investigator, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to be getting paid by the state. First of all, they don't pay the going rate. Mm -hmm. And when you do get paid, I'll probably have whiskers as long as Santa Claus. <laughs> they don't do it. So there is that hopeless imbalance is there. And when you go into court, once again, when I, wa I want to lay the foundation in terms of the atmosphere. When you go into court, and you are, whether you're in jail or whether you're out, because once again, even when you're out, you still feel the sting because when you have to come back every two weeks or every three weeks, try holding a job. Mm -hmm. Try holding a job. Okay. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But not only that, when you, when you think further in terms of coming into court and then sitting there, and you know that everyone in that courtroom, trust me, everyone in that courtroom, whether it's the judge, whether it's the prosecutor, whether it's the court officers, whether it's the court reporter, or whether it's the court clerk, or whether it's the court interpreter, you know what? Most people think that you're guilty. Mm -hmm. Because everything is reversed. See, there is a presumption that you are innocent right. until you're proven guilty. But when you step into the courtroom, mm -hmm. everything is reversed. Because most folks will say, well, uh, if he wasn't guilty of this, he wouldn't be sitting in this courtroom, mm -hmm. would he? And when you get charged with crimes, and this is something that happens, and, and of course, once again, we're not here to, the, the, to bash anyone, especially uh, the least of which is DA, because they're doing their job, but part of being a district attorney in charge is you tend to charge more than what you really need to charge. Mm -hmm. So that when you get up there as a judge and you have a panel of people like this who are being asked to come up, being asked to come up and sit in this jury room in the courtroom, and from this panel, maybe we're gonna, we're gonna cull it down, bring it down to maybe 12, who are actually gonna sit in the box, and maybe two alternates or, 14, or, or, or four alternates. And at that point, 
I asked the lawyers to get up and to turn to the uh, juror, to the potential juror, and say, does anyone recognize these the, any of these lawyers? They'll say no. What about the defendants? Does anyone here say that? No. How many of you know me? They say no. And of course, I'm Christ at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, we move on. And then I have to say, you know, now I'm going to read to you the charges. And I tell them, remember, these are charges, only charges. And trust me, anyone, anyone who walks on these city streets can be the victim of a crime, can also be charged with a crime mm -hmm. by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And I proceed now to read the charges. The charges, really, the true charges may be only two mm -hmm. that really the prosecution can, can actually prove, prove and establish. But there's sometimes 10, 12, and I got to read through all those things. And I'm looking at each and every one of those potential jurors' face. And they're sitting there and they're going like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then afterwards I say, okay, now, these are charges. Remember, these are only charges. The prosecution starts to prove their case. Now I'm going to ask you, how many of you believe, after having heard what the charges are, that you can be fair? If you can't, you raise your hand. Everybody. Then we have to speak to them at that sidebar. And I guess I'm putting this in the context so that you understand that when you have an atmosphere, an environment that's so tense, especially in this day and age, when there's so much surveillance going on, mm -hmm. when it doesn't take much for you to be charged with some sort of a crime, some sort of an offense, things that you perhaps weren't even aware when, you know, was an offense, because there is what they call a criminalization of a whole lot of social activity, something that wasn't criminalized before, it is criminal now. <laughs> so you really have to mind your P's and Q's, and you're mm -hmm. constantly on the defensive. Mm -hmm. you're constantly, so that when you fall prey into the system, woe unto you, because now you feel completely helpless. You feel like a piece of driftwood, uh, uh, you know, a, a piece of driftwood adrift uh, on a stormy sea going this way, because you feel like you don't know where you're going. Family feels it. You feel it. Everyone feels it. You, it's just not the person who's accused, but the entire family feels it. Especially when the pressures are, how are we going to resolve this? If, in fact, you've been charged with a crime, and now you have to, at some point, decide, what am I going to do? I can't hold a job. You go home. Mom might say, well, son, if they're offering you probation, let's talk about that. Probation, that means no jail. If you take this plea, they're saying you don't have to do a day in jail. Go ahead, do it, and you can just get behind it, because we don't need to go back. And of course, if you have to hold the job, you can't hold the job, because you have to make some decision, you're going to plead. You know, like, because the force and the pressure is there for you to plead. Not just from the prosecution and the defense counsel, but guess what? Mom, dad, sister, there are a lot of social forces that are impacting upon you mm -hmm. that perhaps consider it very carefully. Now let's say if you're getting a probation sentence. The prosecution hasn't turned over any discovery, but they're saying, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna give him a break. Uh, let him take this honey deal once in a lifetime. You know, if he takes it, we'll give him probation. Five years probation, and he won't have to stay in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll, he'll, get, he'll get to crime. Most folks are gonna say, you know what? Uh, after having gone back and forth, back and forth to court, being worn down, afraid of the unknown and not knowing what the possible consequences would be. You're going to tend to go along with that. But guess what? You take probation, it's a conviction. And as Chuck mm -hmm. says, it's a conviction. Mm -hmm. There are two types of jails. There are those jails that you go inside and you can't get out because those bars are right there. They're steel. You can smell them. You can taste them. You can hear them. You can live them. But then there is the more sinister type of jail, which is the one that has invisible bars. You don't see them, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And how, and what am I referring to? Those bars that keep you from doing certain things. So once you're convicted, there are certain things that are well, referred to as collateral consequences that flow from a conviction. There's certain job licenses you can't get. You can't get certain uh, real estate licenses. You can't get a barber's license even. If you want to go to school, even if it's a misdemeanor, and you, and, and you get your son or your grandson, who's now unfortunately trying to turn his life or her life around, and they want to go to college, they get accepted to college. But guess what? They can't get a student loan. You can't get a student loan if you want to, at some point, uh, if it was a drug offense, no matter how minor it was, and I'm living at home with my grandma, and she happens to be in New York City housing, uh, she, you, know, you can't go back there, bro. And if we catch you living with your grandma, she's, she's out too. Yep. You're not eligible for food stamps. 
You can't get food stamps or benefits. No one's saying you want to coddle anybody's uh, broken law. But when you want somebody to get back on their feet, how can they get back on their feet? If in fact, all these things prohibit you from doing so. You can't yeah, yeah. even get life insurance. <laughs> You can't even get, you're not even eligible for life insurance. You know why? Because life insurance companies say, you know what? He's a risk. Mm -hmm. If he's living, living this type of life, what's his longevity expected to be out on the street? Yeah. It's harrowing. These are all these collateral concepts that flow. But yet, as a result of taking these convictions, taking these pleas, most of more than not, these defendants aren't told about it. It's now becoming an issue where the courts are saying, we have to inform. We have to inform, the lawyers and also, of course, have to inform these individuals of these collateral consequences that flow from a conviction. A petty larceny, if you get charged, as an example, you get charged with taking some, something from a store, shoplifting, and it's a, a, a petty larceny, an a misdemeanor, one of the lowest types of crime, but it's still a crime, you're not eligible for New York City housing until three years after the sentence is up. Do you believe that? There's a whole lot of things that we don't have. And that's why this, this, this criminal procedure law 240 cuts at the very heart because before a human being can make a decision, a decision that's going to change their lives in such a fundamental and basic way, don't you think that they should have an opportunity to be able to look at the evidence and then to make that decision based upon what is actually out there? Now the prosecutors will say, Judge, you force us to turn over the names of the witnesses and the addresses and what have you, which is what Jersey does which is what Florida does, which is what Arizona does, and which is what Texas does, and I'm going to get there shortly, they're going to endanger those witnesses and they'll never have anybody coming forward to prosecute. That's true. That's a consideration. But that, there are protections for that. And what happens under those circumstances? Let's say if it's a gang-related situation where you know they can be reprisal and people's lives can be put you know, in jeopardy. Well, the prosecutors have a tool. They can come to the judge and say, Judge, I'm going to seek a protective order in this case. The protective order meaning that I normally should turn over all this uh, evidence, all these proofs that I have, but under the specific uh, circumstances of this case, because of the dates, and the prosecutor then has to make the offer of proof. He has to, she has to be able to show to the judge that yes, we should withhold certain information because there is a very real danger here. But that is the exception, not the rule. In New York, it's the opposite. Every case is treated like protective order, and the exception is we'll give out sometimes the proof before we have to do so. Now, as Chucky said, on the criminal procedure of 240, the prosecution is not prohibited from turning this information over beforehand, but they're not obligated to, and the judge can't say anything about that. And it's, as well as the prosecution not having to turn it over, we also know that, in fact, the judge has no say. I want you to understand that the judge has no control, has no final word, cannot tell, cannot order the prosecution to turn it over. Only at the very extreme circumstances does not have the authority to do so. So what do we have? We have a situation where Lady Justice has blindness. What, is, what does blindness mean to you? Well, some people say, well, blindness means that Lady Justice treats everybody equal. But like Chucky said, uh, there is a saying by Anatole France, uh, the law, the majesty, the beauty of the law is that it prohibits, it makes unlawful for a rich man or poor man from having to uh, steal bread and sleep on the bridges. Now think about it. They say that the beauty of the law is that it treats everybody the same. It will punish the rich man just like the poor man for okay. stealing bread and having to sleep on the bridges. Well, the reality is that if you're rich, you're not going to be stealing bread, and the reality is you're not going to be sleeping on the bridges. So guess who's in fact going to get the state? It's the person who, in fact, is most uh, most exposed to having it. And that's why we're here. We're here, plain and simple, because we have to bring it to you, the community, because we need advocates. We need for you to go out there. We need for you to then say one, the, uh, the, the, uh, the mantra, the way that we want you to the, the approach this is one tells two, two tells four, four tells eight, eight tells six. Eight. That's how we spread it. We spread the word. It happened in Texas, of all states. This state was the most draconian state. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. The state that had the most restrictive. Yeah. It had no criminal discovery. <laughs> it wasn't until a, a particular individual was charged with a crime in 1987 for having murdered his wife, only to find out that he hadn't. Only to find out that he hadn't turned over 
they, 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 he had murdered his wife. And what happens? Uh, after years and years and years, they finally passed this law in January 1st of 2014, which says that open and full discovery is the only way to ensure transparency, fairness, and justice. And guess who the governor was who signed it? Bush? No, Rick yeah. Perry. Rick Perry. Rick Perry. Those words came right out of his mouth. So that when you see this in Texas, what excuse or what possible reason could there be for New York not to follow suit? Mm -hmm. So we're here today to communicate that to you. You are the roots. You are the power. Communicate this to our elected officials. Jeff Klein is completely on board on this. Mark Jonah is completely on board. And I want to give a side of hand. So who's Dr. Thompson? But the first lady I want to speak to. And then, correct if I'm wrong. Senator, I don't want to be quoted out of, out, out of context. Senator Thompson said, Judge, use me whatever you, way you want with respect to 240. <laughs> run with it. Run with it. And run with it. So I just want to thank all of you at this point. My God, my God. I'm going to be associate to Tom Berkeley because he's law enforcement. At this point, thank you for our kind of listening. Yes. And I'm just to let you, just to let you know, um, and, I, and I apologize, I, I, brought some, I brought some petitions. I think we got enough. There's nine signatures to the petition. Um, we also have, um, if you go online, you can sign our petition online. It's called www.discoveryforjustice.org. I have some cards that I, okay, she gave them out. And, and up here, we're gonna put the petitions. If you would sign a petition, we would really appre appreciate it because we're trying to get a million signatures before June. And if we get that, that's gonna really help us. <laughs> like the judge said, like, like Chuck said, uh, my, my boss, Senator Ruth Hassan Thompson, his son, he's the ranking member on two committees, Judiciary and Crime Victims, Crime Corrections. And what we're doing in conjunction with, with Senator Klein is to fast track it. So we need to, to have as much support as possible, okay? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, when we're practicing law, to practice law, our job, and not my job, I'm not, I'm just playing with my people. <laughs> the real deal over here <laughs> is the job of, of, of the defense attorney and the prosecutors to zealously defend or prosecute the case and that individual. And you cannot do that if your hand is tied behind your back. So we really need your help. We need to get out there. We need to, so I want to, you know, we're going to put it up in when we speak at, you know, proper venue of our board meeting to, to officially endorse it. So I'm, it has my support, it has enormous support, mm -hmm. and we're, we're, we're with you 110,000%. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Give a big hand to Judge Fernando Tapia. Judge, Judge Klein, and 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 Judge Klein. Any questions? Uh, can we, yeah, I, 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 we have about 10 minutes.